morning. It is good to be in worship with you today. We come to worship to hear and to discern how how God is speaking to our lives and wants to work in and among us. A part of our our faith uh, confession is that uh, Jesus Christ is Lord, that God has dwelled uh, among us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so there is a really, a very real belief that uh, our God is pleased to be in and among us. And so we come to worship, trusting that God is still working in and among us. And so we just come opening up our hearts to honor Him and... Uh, what a privilege it is to be able to be here today in worship. So uh, just a, a couple announcements. Thank you to everyone who uh, came and helped with the Beach to Beacon. It was a wet one, but we had fun and, uh, and a good time. And uh, if uh, this is kind of last announcement, I'll be getting uh, tickets this week. If you want to join some of us to just uh, an outing together, uh, we'll be going to a Sea Dogs game at the end of the month. Feel free to let me know. I'll be getting those this week. But uh, it is good to be able to be here and uh, to honor our Lord. Let's go to worship today. Hear the call to worship and praise Him. Our call to worship is from Psalm 34, verses 11 through 22. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken." Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Why don't you stand with me and we'll worship in song.
pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we give you praise today. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace each and every day in our life that sustains us, that, that helps us day in and day out. Lord, what a privilege it is just to be able to have this, this day to honor you, to praise you for, for the God you are, for creating us, for loving us, for uh, inviting us to be in your presence. Lord, you have been good to us, and today it is our hope that we would be able to, uh, to experience and know your goodness, your mercy, your grace, to be equipped for the days to come, to uh, live lives that would honor you and, f- and put ourselves before you and in service to others. Thank you so much for this time of worship for uh, your goodness to us. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who aren't with us this morning because they are uh, recovering, whether that is from illness or operation. Heavenly Father, I, I pray you would continue 
to provide strength and uh, to continue to provide healing uh, right now. And uh, God, we are just in awe of your love and grace. Pray that you would continue to meet us here precisely where we are and help us to see that uh, we are your beloved children and that you have a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. Lord, we give you praise today and as we get ready to express our thanksgiving and express uh, your goodness through, um, through, through, through the offering, Lord, I pray that uh, uh, it would just be a time of remembering that each moment and each day is a way in which we continually give ourselves to you and pray that you would honor that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you would like to uh, uh, give to the Lord today and uh, bring your offering to the front, you're welcome to do so at this time. Okay, today's first scripture is from first, Second Samuel 15 to 23. Just want to say, I'm going to, I'm going to try to make it through this, this scripture. It's not the easiest one for me, but after Nathan returned to his home, the Lord made Bethesda's baby deathly ill. David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. The leaders of the nation pleaded with him to get up and eat with them, and he refused. Then on the seventh day, the baby died. <sighs> David's advisors were afraid to tell him. It w he was so broken up about the baby being sick. They said, what will he do to himself when, he, when we tell him the child is dead? But when David saw him whispering, he realized what had happened. Is the baby dead, he asked. Yes, they replied. Then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. Then he went to the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and ate. His advisors were amazed. We don't understand you, they told him. While the baby was living, you wept and refused to eat. But now that the baby is dead, you have stopped your mourning and are eating again. David reply, replied, I fasted and wept while the child was alive, for I said, perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when, the, when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. 
be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The word of the Lord. You stand with me and we'll sing our hymn. Uh, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thank you for those uh, scripture readings and the scripture lessons. I, if you have opportunity during the week to utilize the insert, the intersection, sometimes it gives us opportunity to reflect on those a little bit more in preparation for worship. And, and sometimes even in reflecting, we find that some of those readings are pretty hard <laughs> and pretty difficult. And, um, and, that's, and that's a part of the whole story of scripture is that it's filled with Areas that we wrestle and we struggle with, and we say, okay, how do we make sense of this? We find ourselves having uh, read earlier about uh, David when we were in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. We're taking a break today to get to the Gospel of John, but we learned in the story of David and how he treated Uriah when he uh, sinned against him by uh, taking his wife that, uh, uh, that he is not a man of great decisions. And so we, we hear this story in Samuel and we wonder to what extent is there wisdom in this passage or is he throwing away his opportunity to mourn just like he threw Uriah away. And it's a, it's a moment for us to kind of grapple and wrestle with what does all this 
mean and how do we work through this? And it's precisely these kinds of needs that we have that we find that even David had of crying out to God that are part of the needs of the audiences that are surrounding Jesus as he travels and walks this world. And so in the Gospel of Mark, we had just recently heard about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And I suggested when we read that, that uh, there may be some underlying things happening in the story of feeding the 5,000. That this that in this feeding of the 5,000 showing up right after we hear about how the powers of this world works, how Herod does everything he can to secure his own insecurities in this world and his own power by killing John the Baptist. And shortly afterwards, Jesus so, shows a different way of interacting with the crowds. And even though he orders them, for this feeding and for this miracle, he orders them in groups of fifties and hundreds like a centurion would. We find that this is not a military gathering. And one of the things I suggested during that time is the Gospel of John suggests that uh, this gathering was the gathering where they tried to make Jesus king before he slipped away that perhaps they wanted something more. They were ready for something political. They were ready for Jesus to take on power and get that Herod we just heard about that is so bad, that Herod that is acting in, say, in all the wrong ways leaders before, like even David, have done. And that Mark's telling of the feeding of the 5,000 is showing that in all the power plays of this world, God has a different plan and a different purpose for us. We find ourselves today in the Gospel of John, and it is a sneak peek at kind of the message that Jesus was willing to share with those who chased after him to try to, uh, uh, to, try to meet with him after that healing, or after that feeding of the 5,000, who still have needs, who still have concerns, who are still crying out, Lord, there are, there are things that we need you to address, and they, they meet him after he left on the boat on the other side, and John chapter 6 shares with us that this is taking place in Capernaum. Let's start with verse 24, and hear one of the words of Jesus to them and for us today. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, well, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, but not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal and then they said to him, well, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so they said to him, well, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors, well, they ate the man in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so we have this sneak peek by the Apostle John of some of the conversation Jesus is happening with the crowds who have been gathering around him. Mark does a great job of kind of juxtaposing uh, the grace of, of Jesus with the powers of the world that work against the plan God has. And John does this wonderful picture of saying, wait a minute, and there is something so much more to who Jesus is that we need to understand. Uh, and, and Mark, uh, over these last few weeks, we've seen him and the disciples were tired after healing all day, and uh, they had sailed away after feeding the 5,000, but finally the, the crowd found him and asked, uh, when, when he got, and, and, and asked him when he got there and, and you know, how it is that they can continue to uh, work and get him to heal them. And it, it kind of, it's kind of like when I, when I look up on, on Sunday morning, and I look and I'm like, oh wait, 
oh, so, someone is here after all. And I look, I'm like, hey, I didn't know you were here a moment ago because I didn't see you when I was out in the hall or before. In the same way now in, in this gospel, they look up and they say, like, okay, Jesus, you're here. I see you. Uh, and we want to know, how'd you get here? Because we have been looking all day for you. And so they ask him here in this gospel, when did you come here? Uh, we we want to see you. We, we want to know you. We have more concerns. We have more worries. We need you to address those. And Jesus responds to them that he realizes that they are there precisely because of the miracle and they are looking again and again for what are you going to do for me next? He responds to them by saying, you're only here because you ate, ate the loaves. You've eaten, but it's time to look for something more. Something that leads to eternal life. And I, I want to I ask us today to hear this phrase as if we are hearing the term eternal life for the first time. When he says to them, you ate your fill of loaves, but now it's time to work for food that, that uh, endures for eternal life. This phrase, eternal life, has become very, I don't know, we're very familiar with it. We've heard it again and again in church and worship. And even outside of the church, the idea that uh, uh, we have within us perhaps a soul that is eternal is, 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 a, is a philosophical position from the Greeks that has just kind of infected the, uh, our mindset. We understand and we believe, hey, there's got to be something more. But eternal life, when Jesus speaks about it here in John, is very novel and new. Uh, politically, eternal life was um, reserved for those who had positions of influence and power. It was a way in which they spoke about their leaders, the lords over the land, their kings. It was uh, tradition and understanding among so many of the religions and cultures around them that if their leader died, he would ascend to the stars and be with the gods. That it was understood that the person in charge reflected the gods in some way. And that, that was the very heart for uh, the whole cult of Rome that worshipped Caesar, was this understanding that he is in some way related to the gods. And so eternal life was reserved for them. That is, and so when we talked about eternal life, they always talked about it concerning those who were in power. And so when Jesus says, you are going to speak, or you are going to search for and work for bread that leads to eternal life, he is suggesting to them and saying to them that eternal life is not just reserved for those in power. It's not just those who tradition says that when they die, they ascend to the stars or they dwell among the gods. There is eternal life available for all God's people. Uh, it seems like a strange way of thinking, wait, is that really what they thought? But yes, what kind of today the North Korean leader claims for himself was something that was claimed for all the regions at that time. But theologically, this term eternal life for the Jewish faith at that time was a term reserved for God. It was a term reserved for him for only he is eternal, only he is holy. He, he lives above and beyond all the rest. And so when we hear Jesus saying to those who have gathered around him, work for the bread that leads to eternal life. Live and expect the food that God will provide that leads to eternal life. What Jesus is saying here is contrary to popular political opinion. He's saying to them, you, yes, you, with, with no power, with no political influence, with no worshipers, with no followers, you have the opportunity to experience eternal life. In a world full of media celebrities who've engaged in all kinds of electronic communications, many which we can't e ever even imagine disappearing, right? Once in which we recognize, hey, if I want to see somebody or know somebody from ages ago, I can watch an old movie. I could watch an old, uh, an old performance. I, I mentioned uh, last week, I said, does anyone remember old Olympians from, from years past? And, uh, and someone said, oh yeah, yeah, I do. And you know what? Uh, you could go back and you can look and you can see them because it's been preserved. In fact, sometimes interviews with 
uh, people who have been in these uh, uh, various media outlets, whether it's YouTube or whether it's uh, movies or whether it's radio or music, uh, they say, it's so good to contribute to something that is going to last forever, that it's going to have a, a lasting mark. And there's this sense in which we can't imagine a world in which we can't just pull up whoever it is we want to pull up and see and watch and listen to their life and what they were like or what they did or how they entertained. And so it can lead one to wonder and to ask, if I haven't done those things, if I haven't left some legacy of some sort that people can easily access, what about me? Will I be remembered? Will I have, uh, will I have something that lasts forever again and again and again? And Jesus says to the crowds that are gathered around him, whose names are not going to be written in the annals of the kings, he says to them, yes, there is a God who does not forget any one of us, that all of our lives are wrapped up in the eternal memory and life of God. To receive eternal life is to have your life remembered, your life honored, your life lifted up and glorified with Jesus. He says to those who have never been used to hearing the phrase eternal life before, this is available for you. And he's also saying on that theological vein, to the crowd around him, yes, you, even you who have made mistakes, have committed sins. Whether that was purposefully did something you knew you weren't supposed to do, or purposely didn't do something you knew you were supposed to do or purposeful or not, that we can work for food that endures to eternal life. That perfection doesn't come first in the promise God has in store for us, but it comes as a result of the holy God who wraps his holiness around us and embraces us in his holiness. Like a parent who adopts an infant and holds them in their arms and says, now you have a family now you have a home. Now you belong. So in the same way, God in His holiness wraps up uh, the, His creation, uh, his, his beloved children of this world, and says, I have a home, I have a place, and a future for you. And when Jesus says this to these people, who, to work for food that endures for eternal life, he's, He is suggesting you have a place with the most holy Lord. And so these, this, this, this word, work for food that endures to eternal life, carries with it a new kind of hope. For It carries a weight that they had never heard before. There, is, there was no expectation. There was no just preconceived ideas of, oh, this is just something that happens. It, it brings with it the promise of a God who loves even them. And they have worked hard to find this Jesus worked hard to find him that he might take care of whatever needs it is that they have going on right now. They've skirted the shortcuts. They try to, try to beat him there to Capernaum. They found the right paths, and they've been looking all over for him, and they feel like they've finally done it. And that they finally made it. We found him. Now we can get him to do exactly what we want. And it's easy for us, I think, sometimes in our, our faith, to just think, okay, I've made it too. I'm all right. We found the faith that we ascribe to the most. We've avoided the pitfalls and briars of sin. We've, we've shaken off everything that entangles, perhaps what has befallen other people, or perhaps we have, we have encountered him. We've had a particular personal experience. We say, we did it. We found him. We're set. We're good. We're all right. And Jesus says to those who have just encountered him and found him, he says, great, now work for eternal life. Now work for the food that leads to eternal life. And the question is, that they ask is, well, what is that? Now, now that we found Jesus, what, what does that mean? And he just says, believe. Just believe in the one whom God has sent. In the context of these people who have been hunting for him, looking for him, Jesus, where are you? They've been working hard to find him. They have to prove he's close. They just need to have him nearby. I can't help but think when Jesus says to them, just believe, that it's a word of caution to those of us 
who try too hard to force God's hand or try too hard to manipulate Christ's presence, to force God's hand when we say, okay, we have to make sure that uh, um, uh, we can convince God to do something because we've measured up. Or we think we can manipulate Christ's presence if maybe we just create the right environment or uh, we, just, we just meet a preconceived idea of what it means to be holy, then we can guarantee Christ's presence among us. Jesus says to those around him who have searched long and hard for him, just believe and God's grace will meet you. Think of the ways we try to prove Jesus is close to us. Maybe we do it in prayers, with conditional prayers. Okay, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go outside my comfort zone, and I'm going to take care of this issue, or I'm going to meet this need, and, and I just need you to answer this prayer. Maybe we try to prove Jesus is close by becoming great defenders of the faith, by becoming people who say, oh, but I, I know where I stood up, and so, God, I, I know you're with me. Perhaps we try to tell someone else what we think God is saying. Well, God has said this to me. He's saying this to you as well. Uh, we, we become people who, try to, try, who work hard at saying, okay, I found him. I know where he is. I've located him. He's right here. And Jesus says to the crowd who has tried very hard to do that, he says, just believe. He says to those who have worked hard to get close to Jesus, believe. If it feels like he's been away for a while, believe. If it seems like he's been spending time healing others, continue to believe. If, the, if we think we have to defend the holiness of God against the various expressions of the grace of Jesus, just believe. Jesus is speaking about the promise of eternal life for all of them, and he's saying, just believe and it will be enough. And they say, okay, I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe in Jesus. And they say, but maybe just one more miracle. Maybe if you could just show us one more sign, it would be easier to believe. The feeding of the 5,000 wasn't enough. The healings before weren't enough. They say, maybe just one more. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you said to yourself, I really think God was looking out for me here. Maybe it was a close call. Maybe it was a new job opening. Maybe it was the birth of a child. A new friend just when you needed it. Uh, maybe it was something small, something tiny. Like, like someone just providing what you needed in a timely manner or, uh, or calling with the right words to say on a day you needed. Just, just the moment where you say, oh, I think that was a God thing. And, and you just celebrate and you praise God for that, for answering that prayer. But what do we do days later, weeks later, months, or even years later? Sometimes we start to diminish that moment of what happened. What we had seen so clearly before as a working of the Lord, we start to say, okay, whatever. Well, it was nice then, but what about today? What about this moment? And so the words of the crowd in verse 30, when they say to him, what sign are you going to give us so we can see it and believe you? What work are you performing? There are works as well. Whenever we have forgotten what Christ has done before, and we say, okay, God, just one more, just one more miracle, just one more sign. And when they point to the manna, they are pointing to the miraculous daily provisions of God when they needed it most. And they're saying, we just need God every day to show himself in a new way. If God could just provide that miracle of feeding the 5,000 each and every day, we would be fine. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus reminds them that this manna came from heaven and so too would the bread of God. And when they say, give this to us, he lets them know that this provision that feeds us for eternal life comes from heaven and is found in Jesus Christ. The holiness of God is found in Jesus Christ. The holiness that wraps us up and says, you can be a part of the eternal life in relationship with, in presence with this holy God, that is found in belief in Jesus Christ. That is what is called the bread of life. The bread we need is that which prepares us to receive the holiness of God, to receive that enveloping adoption into the family of God. The bread he offers is a place and a home and a world where some have wandered and 
and wondered, where, where, where are we going to get our next meal? What, what, what happens next? And to that, Jesus says, God is with you. And if you trust and believe in him, you will not go hungry. You will not be thirsty. And that's quite a promise to hear that and say, okay, my needs will be met. Sometimes our needs get met because our temporal concerns, the more we think, the more we follow after Jesus, the more we, we uh, continue to, to just say, okay, God, it's about you and not about me. Sometimes our temporal needs, they get replaced with heavenly concerns. We start to say, what I thought I needed before, maybe I don't need as badly anymore. I think when he says, uh, whoever comes will not be hungry, will not be thirsty, I can't help but think that maybe is because he's saying the hunger for the things of God, that his holiness would be at work in our world, that sin would be redeemed, that the, the hunger that God would not be too separated from us, we will start to see that, yes, this God still loves and is redeeming us. And we, will not, and we will find that uh, God provides hope and meaning and purpose each and every day. That we'll find that all of our life is wrapped up in the life and grace of God. That our lives can be perfected and found to be significant to God. That he says, you matter. You are a child of God. And, and as I hear this story in the Gospel of John, where Jesus points again and again, just believe and that is enough. That is the work that we do, that our belief becomes a motivation for us. It becomes the catalyst for us to say, what I do and how I live my life is going to reflect that belief of what God has done and God is doing. And today, as we get ready to receive communion and take bread that we say is the body of Christ, the bread of life for us, the one who is preparing us uh, uh, to be with God for all eternity. When, when, we, when we pray in preparation the Lord's Prayer and we pray, give us this day our daily bread, it is a prayer that on the one hand is absolutely a prayer of God, meet the needs that I have today. This day, will you help make sure that those basic needs are taken care of? But I can't help but think in the context of John that we might also hear those words in another way as well. Lord, give me more of Jesus in my life. I need his holiness. I need his faithfulness. I need his love to fully be formed in me. That it will affect the way in which I interact with the world that you have, uh, that you have created. That I will change how I live. Perhaps it's a way of saying, Lord, give me more of your sustaining grace. That what I need to really sustain me this day and in the days to come is the saving, sanctifying power of your Son that meets me where I am and helps me to live faithfully day in and day out. This, this passage in the Gospel of John is a reminder that we are a people who God has never forgotten. He has not forsaken. Indeed, His grace and holiness meets us where we are to say, I have a plan and a future and a family for you. And you are welcomed to be a part of that. Just believe and, and allow that belief to shape and form your day to day. Let's pray together. Lord, today uh, I, I, I just want to say thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that where we may have searched and, and looked and said, okay, God, uh, how do I find you? What do I do next? What do I need to do to be better, to, to, uh, uh, to, meet your, uh, to, to meet your expectations, to be everything you want me to be? That we find that you are the one who has made the first move. That you are the one who has said, first believe that I have loved you, I have accepted you as you are. You're not proving anything. We are just living faithfully to the grace received. And Heavenly Father, what, what a privilege it is indeed to find that you are the God who meets our needs. Not just our physical ones, but the ones of belonging, of spirit, of love, of knowing that our lives have meaning and purpose today and in the days to come. And it's my hope that, Lord, as we come and receive 
the sacrament of Holy Communion today, that we would remember that in receiving this gift of grace, we are going forth in faithfulness to continue to live out that belief. Lord, be with us today. Help us, Lord, to see how wide and open is your grace. And uh, help us to be faithful to that. Thank you again for this time and your love in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You're welcome to come forward and uh, receive the sacraments. Um, as always, we'll come down this way and go back to our seats this way and um, take, take them together uh, uh, after you've come back to your seats. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ in which he invited us to, to take part in the grace of God who liberates and sets us free. As Jesus had said to his disciples gathered at the Passover meal, after giving thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. He took the cup and after giving thanks said, this is my blood poured out for you. So we will receive these elements in remembrance that God's grace continues to liberate and set us free and sets us free to live a life committed and devoted to him. You're welcome to come and receive these elements of God's grace. body of our Lord Jesus Christ, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance and be thankful. And this cup represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink this in remembrance and be thankful. As the crowd drew around Jesus, continued to ask for his help, he offered them this, just believe. We may not know what happens next, we may not know how God provides, but our belief will carry us, for it is Christ the living one who is with us. Let's sing, I know who holds tomorrow.
promise that God holds our hand is because God's love and grace reaches out to us precisely where we are. May our trust and belief in this God carry us through, recognize that His Spirit is with us, strengthening each step of the way. Go in His grace. Amen.